I think dreaming and states of psychedelic intoxication, possibly the after-death state, possibly the post-apocalypse state for the collectivity. All these things are related to each other and certainly dreaming is the natural access point because it's a part of your experience every day. But these places are what's called state-bounded. It's very hard to bring back information. Uh, you have to have a natural inclination or a technique and it doesn't matter whether you're using drugs or yoga or dream manipulation. It's just a, a matter of exploring the mind by whatever means work. I've seen studies which show that in the deepest part of sleep is the high point of the production of endogenous hallucinogens in the human brain, like DMT and that sort of thing. And nevertheless, it's only in the wildest dreams, which are necessarily the most difficult to recover, that you pass into places which are like these uh, DMT and psilocybin intoxications. Yoga makes the claim that it can deliver you into these spaces. I spent some time looking into that, not a lot of time, but people have different proclivities for these altered states of consciousness. I don't have... It's very hard to move me off the baseline of consciousness. I am very stolid and set in the here and now. And so drugs work better than anything for me. I scoured India and I could not convince myself that it wasn't a shell game of some sort. But in the Amazon, and in other places where the use of plant hallucinogens is understood and used, I mean, you are conveyed into worlds that are appallingly different from ordinary reality and extremely vivid. The vividness of them cannot be stressed enough. I mean, they are uh, more real than real. And that's something which you sense intuitively. They establish an ontological priority. They are more real than real. And once you get that under your belt and let it rattle around in your mind, then the compasses of your life begin to spin. And you realize that, uh, you know, you're not looking in on it, it's looking in on you. I've been talking to a lot of people about ecological crisis and the fate of the world and this sort of thing. Well, imagine in hindsight the wisdom that we would impute to Gaia if we were to suddenly realize that what is happening on this planet is that nature knows that the sun is going to explode. And what we are is a kind of response to the anticipation of a wounding that 50,000, 5 million years ago, the geo-heliocentric relationships began to vibrate out of tune. And um, as a consequence of this, a species was called forth that could organize and escape and we are it. In other words, we are in a divine play in line with this. And what made me even entertain these ideas is I had a very bizarre experience recently. I was in Hawaii and uh, in our botanical garden there is a very large dead tree and one limb of this tree sticks far out over the, over the land. And uh, Banisteriopsis copy, a large hallucinogenic South American vine, is planted at the, at the bottom of this tree. And uh, it just has swarmed up this tree and covered it with greenery. But it wouldn't go out onto this one limb that stuck out. And I, it bothered my sense of symmetry that this vine would not completely cover this tree. And I even thought about trying to climb up into the tree and thread it out onto this limb to get it to do what I wanted. So I was sitting 
looking at this tree and this situation and actually thinking about it and suddenly the limb fell <laughs> it broke off and then I thought and I thought the vine sensed that it was in unstable it would not invade this domain that it sensed was structurally unstable well then I said to myself but how could it what is the mechanism of this sensing of instability and a, a friend of mine said well perhaps the wind impacts on weakened wood differently than on unrotted wood and perhaps rhythms in the tree tell it to stay away from it and then I realized if one plant has that kind of sensitivity to the entering into a domain of danger what must the ecosystem of this planet be doing in reaction to what we are doing to the planet so it, I, I see, uh, the reason this relates to the imagination is because I see uh, ourselves in communication with the imagination. It is sending images back into the past to try and direct us away from areas of instability. It really is, the guy in mind is a real mind, its messages are real messages, and our task through discipline, psychedelics, attention to detail, whatever we have going, is to try and extract this message and eliminate ourselves from the message so that we then can see the face of the other. What is revealed through the psychedelic experience, I think, is a higher dimensional perspective on reality. And I use higher dimensional in the mathematical sense. Literally, you are lifted out of the plane of cultural assumptions and can look down with the kind of godlike understanding that one obtains when one flies in an airplane over a landscape previously only viewed from the ground. In other words, from the vantage point of the psychedelic experience, the cultural landscape is seen more nearly in its correct perspective, seen as historically bounded, spatially and intellectually bounded. History has failed. Western cultural institutions, having become global cultural institutions, now show themselves to be adequate to inspire, lead, or carry anyone into a future worth living in. At this moment, then, this reconnecting to the Gaian mind becomes a kind of moral imperative. So this whole drug issue is not an issue even about criminal syndicates or about untaxed billions or about the mental health of our youth or any of that malarkey. I mean, my God, the most destructive drugs known to the species are peddled on every street corner without restriction. The real issue is what kind of mental worlds shall people inhabit? What kinds of hope shall be permitted? What kind of value systems shall be allowed? And the value systems that aggrandize the possession of things, the tearing up of the earth, competition, classism, racism, sexism, have led us to the brink of catastrophe. Now, I think we have to abandon cultural Western cultural values and return to the deeper wisdom of the body in connection with the plants. That's the seamless web that leads us back into the heart of nature. And if we can do this, then this very narrow neck of cultural crisis can be navigated. And we now hold, through the possession of these psychedelics, catalysts for the human imagination of sufficient power that if we use them, we can deconstruct the lethal vehicle that is carrying us toward the brink of apocalypse. We can deconstruct that vehicle and redesign it into a kind of starship that would carry us 
and our children out into the broad starry galaxy we know to be waiting us. You're trying to go from the entanglement with your personality to recognizing that you're observing yourself in the same way you observe a pen. Like if you sit, if you look at a pen, you're like, oh wow, look, here's a pen. I can see it, I can feel it, I know what it is. In the same way, when you think, God, I feel like shit today, you're observing feeling like shit. You don't feel like shit any more than you're the pen. You're just in the, you're experiencing it within your field of awareness is that thing that you call feeling like shit or feeling happy or feeling sad or feeling good. You're aware of it. So now you've zoomed back a step right and you've become the observer the Atman and that's what you truly are and that is known as the thing that you can't look at that's the thing that is that can't see itself it only gazes out it's also known as the watcher or the witness but that's what uh, that's that's you know for me if I take the right quantity of LSD and uh, allow myself some time alone then I can merge into that state and that's the unified merging into everythingness that people often report on a psychedelic experience is you pop backwards into instead of being the object or rather the subject and the object merge together so there's no more there's no more that which is observed but only and everythingness, you know? And that's what our personalities keep us from experiencing. And a lot of, in Buddhism, a lot of people claim that we cling to our personalities uh, in the same way a person would cling to a pole over a floor covered in razor blades because the Jeez. experience of having a self or an identity for a lot of people is preferable to the experience of merging into everything because merging into everything is death and a lot of people don't want to die so it's really curious though you know there's a lot of like exercises designed to move you out of that attachment to your bodily identification because it's not just what you're wearing it's your body you people think they're their body that's one of the first things you learn is you're not your body you just think you're that's what you are you're not your body any more than you're a pen you're not your body any more than your uh a, a airplane or you're not your body any more than you're your car it's just a vehicle within which you're currently experiencing the universe it's really trippy man it's really fucking trippy being a human being and knowing that you only have a certain amount of time here is the ultimate mind fuck because you're also supposed to be doing things but at the end of doing all those things if your body just stops working like what was really the point of this yeah. like what was the point of this right is it to leave behind a lot of paperwork <laughs> what, what, what's the point of this <laughs> what is the what did you, you know did you did you spread a lot of love dude the thing i wanted to talk to you about um that you were that you were describing with the dolphins is something that i've been reading which is um so I'm reading this book on Buddhist psychology by Jack Kornfield, and it's fucking awesome how deep Buddha uh, went into breaking down the way human beings experience reality. And so the, 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 the idea is that there is a field of consciousness uh, that we are in, like water, like, um, like fish swimming in water. So there's a field of consciousness that we're in, and they compare it to, they use two comparisons. They compare it to a mirror, this consciousness, this field of consciousness. In the way you look in a mirror, a mirror can be reflecting anything. It can be reflecting a beautiful girl. It can be reflecting tigers eating somebody. The mirror is not affected by the reflection at all. So that's this field of consciousness, completely non affected by the things that are emerging into it and uh, uh, never touched by the things emerging into it. So the field of consciousness is like a thing that is flowing through us and we're flavoring it with our experiences. So the experiences that you have as a person is like dropping water, uh, dye into water and there's these temporary colorings of this field of consciousness and that's the human experience. And so, you be so the idea is you begin to watch. You, if you begin to watch, you will start to notice that your experience is broken down into bits, into like these little beads or moments of experience. And with the more you meditate, apparently, the more you realize that like, you know the way you breathe, like if you start watching your breath, this is what I love about meditation, I've been meditating lately, and 
you start, you start, you just watch your breath. That's it. So you sit, you watch your inhales through the nose and exhales through the mouth and you just watch your breath. That's all it is. You just watch your breath and suddenly you realize, fuck man, I've never paid attention to the way I breathe. Like I've never even noticed the way I breathe. And you'll notice that when you inhale, there's a microsecond where you're not breathing anymore. The breath stops. There's a pause in between the inhale and the exhale and the exhale and the inhale. There's this weird little pause, this moment of no breathing. And that's a really important moment in Buddhism because it's supposed to re it represents the exact same thing that's happening with these moments of experience that make up our the thread of our existence. And in between each of these beats or moments of experience, there's this pause. It's a micro pause, like a, probably shorter than a millisecond, but it's a pause and that pause is the field of pure consciousness, which is what we actually are. That's what you really are. You're not, you're the person that you think you are is the experience of consciousness meeting this temporary manifestation that's the atomic cloud or swirl of particles that makes up a Joe Rogan. But that's not what you are. You're just consciousness flowing through it like water through a sea cave or something, you know? It's really cool, man. It's really cool because the idea is that the more you let go of this identity of the self, the more you move into this expansiveness. That's what they call it. They use the cool, really cool terms for it. Clear mind. They always use like the sky, expansiveness. It's this open field of freedom. It's freedom, really. So that reminded me of the joke you were talking about. And, and your joke is very similar to an idea in Buddhist psychology. And, you know, they say, they will say, no, this is not, you know, the prohibition on psychedelics is not what you think, hippie. This isn't done because when people take psychedelics, they recognize that there's some major flaws in the concept of money. And maybe it isn't the best thing to sell your life energy uh, for the majority of your life to somebody to make way less money than you deserve for selling the life energy of a being that as far as we know is completely unique at least in this galaxy if not in i mean planets are relatively unique so if you're a being on a planet that's aware of itself you're a pretty special thing as far as our understanding of the universe goes so your life energy per hour is actually super precious. probably a billion dollars an hour is what anybody's life energy is really worth so anyway the whole point is you no, start not, taking that's a great point I mean, that's the, that's the key to life. The key to life is to value your time. Right. The key to life is to value your time and try as much as you can to direct it towards things you love, being with people you love, doing things you love. Right. And recognize that the more you do that you have to compromise, the more you do where you're only doing it for a paycheck or you're only doing it because you want to play it safe or you're only doing it for uh, any, any, what, figure out whatever the negative reason would be. Anytime you're doing yeah. anything like that, you're wasting time. Yeah. You're wasting the most precious thing you can have. Yeah.